All right, we have Chase Hooper joining us on the show. At the end of last year, he made his Octagon debut, finished Daniel Tamer via TKO in the first round of UFC 245. It was a very impressive debut for The Dream, who is on the show right now. Chase, how are you, man? Good to see you. Hey, thanks. Uh, I'm good. I'm just trying to you know, deal with all the boredom from not having my normal schedule and uh, kind of being locked down inside my house right now. I was going to I was going to ask how the quarantine life is treating you. It seems like just looking at your videos and your posts on social media, it seems like you have sort of an uncanny ability to to keep yourself entertained in, in these types of situations. For sure. Uh, I kind of grew up having to do a lot of stuff to entertain myself. So I'm pretty good at, um, you know, wasting time. And, uh, you know, I definitely like having a lot of free time. But after a while, it starts to. Um, you know, be too much. Yeah, I would agree with that. People are, you talk to different people and they're using this time to find some different skills, maybe take on some sort of hobby they've been putting off over the years. Have you been able to, to find something new to help you maximize this, this free time? Uh, honestly, right now I'm trying to focus on, uh, you know, like keeping my weight similar. So I guess I'm trying to acquire the skill of not binge eating as much anymore and kind of, you know, being a little more measured with my diet. Other than that, I don't know. Uh, I've been roped into a lot of painting projects um, unwillingly, but I've been doing it. So there's that. This has been a, like kind of going back through the timeline. This has been a wild few months for you, has it not? I mean, between the debut to getting a lot of camera time you're interviewing guys like mike tyson like how would you describe these last four or five months has it just been a blur yeah it's been crazy um ever since let's see my last fight on fight pass i think um back in july or something um that's when all the media stuff started kicking off um because i got to throw out like the first pitch for a mlb game um that was cool and then I got to go to like a gator farm and stuff and then had to fight, you know, a couple of days after that. That was crazy. Um, but yeah, I've been doing a lot of stuff with Fight Pass. Fight Pass is super cool to me. Um, and it's been it's been fun. I've been having a good time just, you know, flying around and doing weird stuff like uh, going to NASCAR, um, you know, interviewing guys before their fights, you know, getting to switch it on everybody. And uh, yeah, it's been fun. Were you a big NASCAR fan before you guys teamed you teamed up with Fight Pass to do these interviews? I didn't really know anything about NASCAR. Um, the most I knew is that like my grandpa used to watch NASCAR races when he would like you know watch me or something while my parents were out you know running errands. So I'd just see you know cars going in a loop. But uh, it's definitely more interesting to watch in person, and uh, I had a good time with it. I was talking to Mike Tyson. Was it was it terrifying? It was like, uh, yeah, he was like, uh, it felt kind of like the tigers that are at the zoo. You know, they're definitely, you're scared of them, but they're like pretty mellowed out right now. Um, I think he was kind of, from what I have heard, he's like, uh, being that he owns like Tyson Ranch and stuff now, that he's big into weed, he's definitely much more mellowed out than he used to be. Um but yeah, he was uh, he was a super cool guy, super nice. Um, I'm sure he deals with a lot of that stuff all the time, so he kind of gets right into that like you know fan mode, I guess. But yeah, he was a super cool dude. So let's talk about 245, the fight with Tamer. I mean, that fight was was wild for as long as it lasted. I mean, you took some big shots, you battled through it, you got the finish in the first round. You had to have taken a ton away from that four four and a half minutes and change. Had did you not? Yeah, I was uh, I was happy with my performance. I was happy it was a good fight. And uh, the way it worked out, it was short enough um, of a fight that they had like little gaps. So I got to go on ESPN2. They showed my fight twice. Um, that was nice. But it was, uh, it was definitely a fun debut. I had a good time with it. Um, like I went into the fight, I didn't care. Like I was, I was there, I was happy, I was excited. Um, to just make it to the UFC and I was kind of ready to see what would happen. And, uh, you know, he was definitely, um, I'm sure he'd been training for me to like try to shoot for that for a while. But, uh, you know, I feel like my submission defense is pretty good. 
Um, even the shots that he um, caught me with, they weren't even like super hard. It was just uh, like I'm kind of still like Bambi, you know, a little bit. Um, I wobble pretty easily, but it's not um, it's not getting rattled or anything. It's just like weird balance stuff. I'm still figuring out my body. Um, but yeah, like I think he caught me with like a first overhand and it hit me like right in the uh, orbital. So I didn't really feel that. It was just like a little like push, I guess. And then I think there was another one where he ended up hitting me in the shoulder and it was just those two big shots. But uh, yeah, he was a tough opponent. Um, definitely got a lot bigger than uh, he was at the weigh-ins. He, uh, he must have been like 20 pounds bigger. But uh, yeah, it was definitely a good um, introduction to the UFC and an introduction for... I feel like the UFC fans to me and my fighting style. Did you notice that he was just much bigger looking across the octagon for me? I'm sure you're thinking about a million different things, but as you're looking across the cage and you're seeing Tamer, you're just like, Oh my God, he's way bigger than he was yesterday. Yes. And once, uh, once we started grappling a little bit, I noticed it too. Cause I was like trying to push him a little bit and they just wouldn't like, it's like trying to push like your older brother around when he's just, you know, way bigger than you and way more mature. So it's like, uh, you know, it's definitely fighting against the tide, I guess. But um, that's more my style anyways. I don't – I'm not super big on uh, trying to force the issue. It's more kind of like pulling the guys into me and seeing what happens. Um, I'm not super powerful. I'm not super explosive. So I kind of, you know, try to trap guys and stuff and see how it works out. Did you think – I mean, I know you had a relationship with Fight Pass. You were doing stuff when you were getting prepared for the for the Titan FC fight and then sort of building up from there. Did you think that you would be more thrust into these roles even more so like you have and that you'd – I guess for lack of a better term, you're kind of blowing up like in that way. Do you – like did you see this coming? Not this quickly. Um, I know that – UFC likes me. I know that I have, you know, like I have something different, I guess. Um, I don't just look like the standard fighter. Like I'm not just some jack dude with tattoos and like a beard or something. Uh, you know, I'm this skinny kid with, you know, an Afro and like a little bit of peach fuzz going on here. Um, so I think that kind of sticks out, but, uh, you know, like there's probably only a few notable exceptions for people that have been getting as much exposure after just one fight. Um, so I'm definitely super appreciative of that. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's moving quick. And my thing now is, you know, like they're helping me out in pretty much every way they can besides, you know, the fights and winning the fights. Um, that's the only part I got to do on my own. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of on me right now. You seem really relaxed in those types of situations. <laughs> Have you always been I guess, cool in front of the camera or are you actually just putting on a really good poker face and you're, you're scared to death doing it? No, I, uh, I definitely, um, I've definitely acquired that skill, I guess, or I've gotten better at it. <clears throat> I guess the point of a lot of the stuff I do with fight pass is that it's still kind of awkward. <laughs> so that makes it a little funnier. Uh, <clears throat> but like I took video production in high school and those videos, there's somewhere on the internet. I've I've had a couple people like DM me the videos, um, but they're pretty bad. Like uh, we can't even like me and my buddies pretty much just would mess around and film random stuff to get you know to get the grades in and you know pass the class. But um, you know like we could, couldn't even stare at the camera and like keep a straight face, let alone like have lines and figure that stuff out. So now I've definitely acquired. Um, more of the interviewing and more of the camera skills. And plus you've been uh, sort of united with, with your dad, Ben Askren, with all of this. Th th that's been a lot of fun to watch. How has that been? I mean, it just, you kind of threw it out there, it became a thing, and now everybody just loves it. How's that been? Yeah. Uh, actually, I was surprised it was more, like he kind of initiated it a little bit. Because um, I remember after the fight, uh, when I did do all my media stuff, they were asking like, oh, did you see what Ben Askren said? And I was like, oh, I have no idea. And then they showed me, and I was like, oh, you know. Uh, he said, like, good job, son, or something. And that kind of <laughs> kicked it off. Uh, but, yeah, he was super cool with it. We keep going back and forth. It's a good time. Um, we were actually supposed to meet up um, when I went out for the McGregor-Cerrone card because um, Macy Barber was on there. 
Queen Corners. Um, but then she got hurt. Uh, we were actually going to go out after the fights and get some ice cream and kind of, you know, put some content out. But, uh, yeah, Macy got hurt, so it kind of, um, he got caught up with that, and it didn't really work out. Um, and also, before all the corona stuff started popping off, he kind of wanted me to come out and train with him at his gym. Uh, and I was going to, but then kind of, um, yeah, everything happened, and it didn't really work out. So that's on the bucket list for 2020 at some point. Ice cream and or training with Ben Askren. For sure. Both, hopefully. There you go. So I saw you mention on Twitter last week after the UFC announced the postponement of the upcoming events, beginning with UFC 249, that you were supposed to fight next month. Was that uh, When was that supposed to happen? Was that the May 16th card that was supposed to take place in San Diego, or was it a different card? Yeah, it was the San Diego card. Um I was, it's kind of weird with all the quarantine stuff, trying to still train and diet down when, uh, you know, like my training schedule is super minimal now because everything is, you know, like it's illegal to go to the gym and train. So it's kind of, uh, it's a weird dynamic, um, to try to diet down when all you're doing is like sitting in your house all day and to also prepare to, you know, fight somebody else in, in a cage, um, who's also preparing for it just as like hard as you are, um, when you can't go to the gym. Uh, but yeah, I think that was kind of, you know, UFC tried to do all that they could. Um, but it didn't work out. Maybe, uh, it's sounding like a lot of the fights are going to get rescheduled and kind of put on fight Island. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to keep the same opponent and kind of get on a private Island. Uh, that'd be cool. I was just going to ask if uh, if you could reveal who the opponent was, but it sounds like from your conversations that this fight may still be on the table, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I signed the contract, so hopefully. Um, but I guess we'll kind of figure that out. And uh, if the fight's still on the table, we'll find, a, we'll find a fun way to announce it, I think. I was talking with uh, some of my buddies over at Fight Pass, and we'll kinda, we were kind of spitballing some ideas. We'll see. When you think about Fight Island, because I think when Fight Island comes up and Dana Whiteley started talking about private islands and stuff, I think we all had this certain vision of what Fight Island could be in our own ways, like what it could look like. Yeah. When you think about like the aesthetics and the the look of, you know, beautiful, majestic Fight Island, like how do you see it? Is it beautiful? Is it even majestic? Like how do you see it sort of laid out in your mind? First of all, I'm hoping it's tropical. Uh there's definitely like private islands. I Googled it. There's some off like the coast of Nova Scotia. That's not what I'm going for. <laughs> uh, you know, Canada's nice, but it's not uh, it's not as nice as like Fiji or like uh, the Caribbean. So that's what I'm hoping more of. Um, yeah, I don't know. Other than that, my you, I'm hoping we're not fighting in a tent. Uh, I've done that before. Um, but yeah, having an actual building would be nice with some AC, uh, maybe some sweet dorm rooms to train with, you know, some of the other crazy dudes that just happen to fly out there and fight. Um, it's cool that they said that they're going to let people train out there um, to kind of get back to full capacity as much as they can before the fights. I'd definitely be interested in that. When was the last time you fought under a tent? Probably more of my amateur shows. Uh, I guess some of my early pro fights uh, before Contender Series. So it's probably been a year or two. But uh, yeah, it's kind of hard in Washington because the weather's pretty bad most of the time. Um, there was actually one time where we fought inside, but they made us warm out, warm up uh, outside in these little tents that they set up, and it was freezing. Um, but there wasn't even like a mat or anything. We were just on like the tarmac and it was, uh, you know, it was interesting for sure. Can I just ask you, and I know it's not like too long ago, really thinking about it. October, 2016, I think it was rumble on the Ridge. You make your amateur MMA debut, right? This is this, yeah. you're 17 years old. What was that night like for you? Like, you know, you're about to have your first MMA fight. You obviously get the win. Is that a night that, that you look back on and remember fondly? Yeah, I guess a lot of my fights are pretty similar uh, the way I feel. But the first one is definitely um, it's definitely hard. 
uh, I remember I was actually the first fight on the card. And then uh, one of my teammates was the main event. So he kind of bookended it. Um, but yeah, it was crazy. Like getting there at what, like four and the show starts at like seven. So you have three hours of just waiting around. I was sweating the entire way there. Um, this happens at most of my fights, though. Uh, when we do the medical stuff, they always have to, like, check my pulse again or, like, recheck my blood pressure because it's just, like, the adrenaline's going at least, uh, or at least it used to. Um, and then, yeah, so it's just crazy um, getting your hands wrapped and all that for the first time starting to hit pads you don't even know um really what to expect you're like oh am i gonna go out there and get beat up in front of my family and then never do this again or you know am i gonna win and we'll go from there uh i had a lot of experience before that that fight um with a lot of like jujitsu tournaments and stuff coming up um but that's all like there's multiple mats people aren't really watching specific matches unless they know you um or your opponent i guess but here it's like an entire crowd of, you know, a thousand people or something that are just watching you and the other guy, you know, fight as hard as you can to try to, you know, hurt each other and see what happens. Um, but yeah, I went out there and it was kind of like a whirlwind. Um, I actually uh, uh, won my first amateur fight by TKO, um, surprisingly, from the feet. Uh, definitely didn't carry over to the rest of my career. Um <laughs> I remember actually uh, probably the funniest moment of the fight. Um, the guy's mouthpiece fell out, so then I just like stopped. I just waited for him to pick it up, and my coach was like yelling at me. He was like screaming like, "No, no, no, no! Keep going, keep going! The ref, the ref will stop it." So I kind of um, they made fun of me about that for a while, and then uh, actually that one was at a casino too. So as soon as I got done fighting. Um, they took me into the back room and they were like, Hey, you can't go out until you leave here. Um, you know, if not, we're going to kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> That's so crazy. Uh, do you remember who you fought that night? <sighs> Ooh, I don't really remember his name. Um, he was another amateur guy. Patrick Harris. Mm. I remember just because of Doogie Hauser, uh, Neil Patrick Harris that stuck out. Yeah, that was actually his last fight. Doing my research. I, I've noticed that several of the guys that I fought, they haven't fought after. I don't know. I don't know if that's just a coincidence or if, like, you know. Yeah. I don't you're know. A, I kinda, you're a career killer, Chase. It's a weird thing. Like, uh, I don't necessarily want to be that guy, but I guess for me, it's just all about keeping the momentum going and, you know, self-preservation. Like, I don't want to get beat up, so. Coming off the Contender Series, you got that developmental deal. And I've talked to fighters who have been on those kinds of deals, and they absolutely love it. Like, they love the developmental deal because they can fight as often as they want. They can get some tough matchups. They can bounce around a little bit with weight classes. How beneficial did you find the developmental deal? I, uh, yeah, I was a huge fan of it. Um, it's, uh it was kind of difficult at first right after contender to know that I wasn't quite ready for the UFC, but I definitely appreciate having the time to kind of, um, mature and to kind of get more experience before jumping up to the big show. Um, it was nice to at least have, um, like I know how much money I was going to be making instead of having to negotiate it fight by fight. Uh, like you do with all the local shows and stuff. Um, so then financially, I'm set. I don't have to worry about my bills. I can just focus on training. I can just focus on fighting. Um, that was fantastic. And then, yeah, I was able to travel around, start doing more media stuff, um, getting used to, you know, flying somewhere, then having to do interviews and stuff leading up to the fight, cut weight at a different location, weigh in and fight, um, and then fly back home the next day. Very similar to how you have to do it for the U for the UFC. Um, and then, yeah, uh, you kind of have that target on your head. So everybody's trying to fight you cause they want to, you know, kind of steal that momentum. Um, but yeah, I had a great time with the developmental deal and I think it really let me figure out my style. Let me kind of 
refine um, the weight cut, all the traveling stuff, and just kind of get everything figured out so that I come into the UFC more prepared. I feel like that target is still on your back. I don't know if you feel the same way because I've interviewed a lot of fighters on the regional scene over the last year. A lot of these guys are, are real close to a UFC call or a contender series shot. And your name is is the most popular name that comes out of these guys' mouths if they're 35, 45, 55. Do you like having that that target on your back or is it, you know, do you sort of appreciate that at the end of the day, being a 20-year-old and all these people want to fight you? I think it's kind of uh... – I think it's kind of weird for people to call out the guy that's like younger, like significantly younger, but I, I understand for them why it makes the most sense. Um, it's, it might seem like an easier fight. Like I'm not, uh, I'm not like a Jeremy Stevens or somebody that's going to just like maul you and like, you're going to come out like all just beat up. Um, you know, like if I beat you, I might just choke you out and then you're, you know, you walk home fine. Uh, so for them, it might seem low risk. Um, I understand that. And with like higher reward based on all the, um, I guess, hype around me and like everything right now. Um, but I just kind of try to take it fight by fight. Like I don't really pay too much attention to that, um, especially with people outside of the UFC. Because it's like um, we kind of we're not even in the same organization yet. So there's no point in me planning to fight all these, you know, like 30 guys that want to beat me up. Um, you know, uh, and that's not really the way I think about fighting. I kind of, uh, I think about it more in like a competitive way than like, uh, you know, I got to be mean to everybody and I got a mean mug and, uh, you know, just kind of kill everybody in the division. Um, I realize that it's like a fight by fight thing. You're not necessarily going to fight every single person in the division. So I kind of, uh, you know, if somebody wants to fight me and then we end up signing a contract, then, you know, we'll go from there. But, uh, like just tagging Sean Shelby and Dana in like a little Twitter post isn't gonna, you know, that's not going to move the wheel very much. So I kind of, uh, take it at face value. Have you had, have you fought somebody, but have you fought anybody that you've actually had like animosity towards or beef towards it doesn't seem like you're that kind of a guy but maybe once in a while that's happened for you i don't know no i'm not really like uh i think it was my last fight before contender um i was actually fighting the guy like we were in the fight and the dude started like uh trying to punk me out he started calling me like a bitch and stuff in the fight and i remember just thinking like how ridiculous that was <laughs> like i was kind of i was already beating him so i don't know what he was trying to get from me and then like like i don't know i just thought it was kind of funny i laughed a little bit to myself and then uh you know kept on fighting or like uh my debut for ufc um the guy tried to get in my face a little bit at the weigh-ins i i also thought that was kind of ridiculous like uh he was super respectful whenever i saw him before that moment so i kind of you know i understand that people do it for the stuff um or for the you know the crowd reaction but I don't really, I don't think of fighting like that. Um, I'm not super emotional for fighting. I'm more, um, more mental, I guess. I try to think about stuff, uh, overall. And, uh, yeah, I think that's more how I go into it. It seems like the biggest fight of your career is going on right now with Twitter. I mean, the blue check mark still not next to your name at this point, which I think is an absolute outrage at this point. Like what is going on with the, with the blue check mark? How has this not happened yet? Uh, actually UFC just hit me up. They said, I guess they send out, uh, names to Twitter for them to hopefully verify people. But, uh, they said it could take another month. Um, I get, I'm guessing it's because of the Corona stuff. Everybody's working from home. Um, but yeah, Twitter's definitely taking their sweet time. Um, and I guess there's nothing I can do about it. It puts more value on it though, I guess. As we're in this state of uncertainty right now, obviously the blue check marks and be coming and you're off to the races, but this might be a tough question to answer. Career goals for 2020. Like, where do you see, I know you take things fight by fight, but you know, I'm sure you're thinking about where I want to be here and where I want to be here. Where do you see yourself at the end of this year? Not only in the octagon, but out of it as well. I'd like to hopefully it's hard because of the Corona stuff. Like, I don't know how that's going to affect, um, you know, these upcoming cards, um, I've seen Dana say that they're trying to 
have the same number of fights scheduled for the year. Like they're still trying to make all the fights happen. Um, so as long as that works out, I'd like to get maybe two or three fights in this year, depending on when my, um, fight that I already signed for happens. Um, as long as everything's still on the table, uh, I'd like to stay busy as long as I can get three good fights, three good wins in, um, I'd be happy with that. Uh, outside, I guess I just kind of, um, I want to start branching out a little more, maybe kind of just making myself more valuable to the company, I guess, uh, like doing more interview stuff with fight pass, uh, you know, maybe doing jumping on the UFC streaming stuff more. Um, maybe if they need like another skinny kid with an Afro for a Reebok model, I'll jump on that or something. <laughs> If I'm not too beat up by the end of the year. There you go. You can have your own podcast. I mean, I could see you doing that. You know, you and Ben Askren, you cool. could co-host it together. That'd be <laughs> yeah. a lot of fun. I think, uh, I think more of my interesting side comes out when I am on the internet. Like, I don't know how funny I can be on video or like, you know, on a podcast for a very consistent amount of time. Um, I don't know. We'll see. I definitely would like to put out more content, but uh, I don't want to just pump stuff out and have people be annoyed by it or uh, kind of have it be counterproductive. I'm trying to uh, kind of walk that fine line between doing a lot and then doing too much. It's a good way to look at it. It has been a, an incredible stretch for Chase Hooper, now 1-0 and in the UFC, soon to be Twitter verified. He's the talk of the town right now, youngest fighter on the roster. Life is uh, is pretty good right now for the dream. Chase, I appreciate the time, man. All the best to you. Stay healthy and safe. Look forward to whatever it is is next for you, man. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you too. I appreciate you having me on.